again, Mark's Gospel, and we're in chapter 15. And we're in the time of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, shall I say, the hallmark of the Christian life is to believe that Jesus died for our sins. He went to the cross and shed his blood that through his blood we might have forgiveness of sins if we believe upon him as our saviour. Well, in chapter 15 we find this that we had looked at uh, chapter 14 Jesus had been taken the Mount of Olives and brought to the high and brought to the high priest's house and now the priests bring him to Pilate you see one thing that the Romans did not grant to the Jews was the power to execute someone and the chief priests were intent on executing Jesus and the only one who can give the order is Pontius Pilate the Roman governor so now they've got to bring Jesus to Pontius Pilate he's the only one who has the power to execute him to crucify him and so straightway in the morning uh, there we have those words straightway because that's Mark you know moving quickly and so they did they moved very quickly probably this was about 6 a.m. in the morning and uh, they carried him away and delivered him to Pilate well the other gospels explain that uh, the chief priests you know brought Jesus to Pilate because he said he was the king of the Jews and uh, Pilate said will you try him or they said no we cannot you know have the death penalty we brought him to you well Pontius Pilate does not want to uh, shall I say crucify Jesus number one he knows he's innocent Number two, his wife has had a dream whereby uh, she was shown what her husband was going to do. She had a dream. She was taken up to heaven. And she saw in heaven everybody so sad. And uh, she said, well, why is everybody so sad in such a wonderful place? They said, your husband is going to crucify the Son of God. Well, after that dream, she comes back and she uh, sends a note to her husband. You know, have nothing to do with this righteous man because he's innocent. And Pilate himself does not want to crucify him. But let us look at the narrative here. So they brought him to Pilate and in verse 2, he said, Art thou the king of the Jews? And uh, Jesus must respond. And Jesus said, Well, you've said it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but to those things he didn't answer anything. And uh, Pilate said, But you're not answering. And again, Jesus would not answer the accusations. And Pilate marveled because any other prisoner is going to defend himself like anything to save himself from the death penalty. And then there is, what shall I say, a custom that had been developed by the Roman governors that on the feast day they would indeed offer to the uh, public 
the opportunity of having one of the prisoners that he had released. Well, why is this so important? Well, in actuality, you see, it comes out in uh, the book Numbers and elsewhere. That on the Day of Atonement, there are two goats brought before the high priest. From one, he puts his hands and, you know, pronounces all the sins of Israel. And the other one is taken and slain, whilst the one with all the sins is let go in the wilderness. Now then, here is the interesting thing. Jesus was the innocent one. He should have been released. Oh no. He is crucified. Whereas Barabbas, who was a murderer, is released. See? And this is symbolic, you know, of us and Jesus. We are the guilty ones. We should have died. But no, he took our place and died on the cross for us. Because, you see, God in his mercy, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so that is the significance of this ceremonial act whereby Pontius Pilate said, well, whom do you want me to release? Barabbas or Jesus? And uh, the multitude, you know, stirred up by the chief priest, said, release Barabbas. And uh, he knew, see, Pontius Pilate was no fool. He knew why the chief priests had brought Jesus before him. It was because they were envious of him. It was because he was doing all the miracles and, you know, uh, he had such a wonderful doctrine that everybody was coming to Jesus instead of going to them. And they were losing their authority and they wanted to retain that authority they wanted to retain their position and so they wanted to get rid of Jesus well there we are so Pontius Pilate said well what do you want me to do with the king of the Jews and they cried out again crucify him and he said well what evil has he done And in the other Gospels, we find that he took water, washed his hands, and said, I'm innocent of the blood of this good man. No, Pilate, you're not. Because you have the supreme authority to make a decision as to whether Jesus is innocent, and therefore you have the whole of the Roman army to support you, And you should have freed him. Oh no, you cannot get away, Pilate, by washing your hands and saying, well, it's your fault. Well, in the other Gospels we're told that the congregation said, well, the blood of Jesus be upon us and our children forever. And that's exactly what happened. You know, in about 70 AD, the Roman army under Titus surrounded Jerusalem and contrary to Titus' desires they destroyed the temple as Jesus said it would be destroyed but you know they crucified 4,000 young men of the Jews and from that moment onwards they have been rejected you see they have been rejected because they shed the blood 
of the Son of God. And they will not come back into covenant relationship with God until he comes back on the Mount of Olives. Now, what they said, crucify him. Yes, his blood be upon us and upon our children forever. Well, Pilate, now in verse 15, you, you see the attitude of Pilate, willing to content the people, willing to content the people. He's not there for the people. He is there for the Roman emperor to indeed meet out true justice. And he doesn't do that. Oh, how important it is when you're in a position of authority that you're not swayed by people, but you hear from God and do that which God wants you to do. You do that which is right. Well, what was the end of Pilate? Pilate was wrong. He knew he was wrong. He even wrote a letter afterwards of which we have a record. He wrote a letter to the Roman emperor confessing that he had crucified an innocent man. Well, what was the end of Pilate? Well, he was taken away from the governorship and uh, he was told by the emperor to commit suicide. And uh, he went up to the mountains of Switzerland as a particular mountain there called Mount Pilatus. And it is said that from that mountain he threw himself off to commit suicide according to the orders of the emperor. Well, he gave the order to scourge Jesus, release Barabbas. And now I want you to see something of what Jesus suffered for us. It wasn't just the act of crucifixion which was bad enough. But look what it says. You know, the soldiers mocked him. They brought him to the Praetorium, which is, well, the military headquarters of the Roman army, wherever they are. And uh, they called together the whole band. They clothed him with purple, planted a crown of thorns, put it upon his head. Can you imagine what that is like? And not only that, they smote him on the head in verse 19 with a reed. Our head. Oh, my. Can you imagine those thorns going into his head? And then having a reed smote him. Didn't mean to tap him. They hit him with all the anger that they could muster. And can you imagine what his head was feeling? It was ringing. Have you ever been with people who have migraine? They are not compass mentors. They have this terrible aching all, ti- all the time with migraine. But migraine is nothing compared with what he went through. You know, those thorns in his head, that reed coming down. And on top of all that, he was scourged, which means he was beaten 39 times with a whip that had little pieces of flint in and tore his flesh 39 times. Can you imagine after that how he was? And was he in the uh, strength of manhood? He was about 30 years of age, 33 years of age. Well, no, because we're told in the Psalms that he died 
of a broken heart. All the confrontations that he had with the scribes and Pharisees during his ministry, you know, had broken his heart. And uh, I think any of us who have to confront people at times, we are very aware that it has an effect upon our heart. And uh, we can feel the aching in our heart. But for him, it was the breaking of the heart. And so, yes, he was 33 years of age, but he was worn out. His heart was that of an old man. He was worn out. He has the crown of thorns. He has a reed. He's scourged. And so he had not the strength to carry his cross. And that was demanded as part of the punishment. They had to take their cross. And so they compelled one, Simon, a Syrian Phoenician, a Cyrenian, who passed by to bear his cross. He hadn't got the strength. Even the Roman soldiers realized that. He was a broken man. And yet, his ministry has not yet finished. Because he still has, if I could say that, certain things to fulfill on the cross. And I find that so remarkable that in his weakened condition, God requires seven sayings on that cross. You know, he had to hold himself, shall I say, responsible on that cross to fulfill his ministry. I don't know how he did it. You know, I've just come from hospital and I've had uh, serious pain when I felt I could do nothing. But it was nothing compared to what he went through. I admire him tremendously for a number of things. But I admire him for the demeanor that he portrayed on that cross. And on that cross he indeed accomplished certain things. We'll look at that. Well, first of all, they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. The purpose of that was to dull his faculties so that the pain of the crucifixion may be alleviated. And then he had to watch his garments you know, parted and soldiers casting lots for them. All these things had been prophesied in the Psalms. He was well aware of those things. And uh, then he had to have over his head the reason why he was crucified. And all they said was this, this is the king of the Jews. The chief priests objected. They said to Pilate, don't write that. Right, he said he was. Pilate, furious with them, causing him to, you know, have a traversity of justice. He didn't want to crucify him. He was going to have the last say. So he said, what I've written, I've written. He wouldn't change it. No, because he was the king of the Jews. And uh, then there were the two thieves Well, it doesn't mention it here in Mark, but the other Gospels mention the fact that these two thieves railed upon him. They said, you know, you've saved others, save us. But uh, Jesus answered nothing. And then his very demeanor, one, one of the thieves who repented and said, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord responded, You know, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Yes, his demeanor 
won the one on the cross with him. And then uh, the others mock him. And now there comes darkness over the face of the earth between the sixth and the ninth hour. And I should explain this. The sixth hour, you know, in Jewish chronology is midday. Ninth hour would be three o'clock. And so uh, for three hours, darkness covers the whole land. And then uh, <coughs> Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because all this time he was conscious of the presence of God, seeing him through. But at this particular time, the Lord, somebody had a vision of this, and they told me that they saw the father's face turn away from looking at his son. And the son was conscious of that. He said, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? When he had to, because the Holy Father could not look upon sin, and his son had become sin for our sakes. Well, then uh, something happened. He gave up the ghost in verse 37 and cried out, it is finished. It's finished. Yes, he knew when his hour had come, when he must go through these terrible agonies, but he also knew when it was finished. But here I want to pause because the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And I've had a vision of that. It's a very thick veil, incidentally. It is a veil that hangs between the holy place and the holy of holies. It could only be entered through once a year on the Day of Atonement by the High Priest. No one else could go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies with God. But you see, in the Epistle of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul speaks of the fact that God has opened up a new and living way whereby we as Christians, through the death of Christ, are permitted to enter the very presence of God into the Holy of Holies with him. Oh, what a privilege it is to be a Christian and not to be an Old Testament saint who did not have that privilege because the way had not been opened, because Christ had not died so that that veil could be rent. Well, we go on. And this is uh, something in verse 39. You know, I said before the demeanor of Christ on the cross. One, the thief. One, the thief. But it also impregnated somebody else. And that was the centurion, the captain of the band. And uh, this is what he said. When he saw that Jesus cried out, gave up the ghost, he made this comment. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. Have you had that revelation? He's not just a prophet. Everybody declares, the whole world will declare. He was a good man. He was a prophet. He was a prophet of prophets. No. No. He was more than that. He was the son of God. And you see, the great difference between a prophet and the son of God is this. The prophet declares the word of God. But the son of God was a sacrifice for our sins. He was the one, you know, who said at the Last Supper, as he poured out the wine, he said, this is my blood shed for you. This is a new covenant in my blood. No prophet could say that. 
only the Son of God. And you see, this is the important factor that Jesus was the Son of God, the centurion and the thief on the cross both had that marvelous revelation. Oh, you are the Son of God. Have you got that revelation? Jesus is the Son of God. Well, you know, when he died, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, who also waited for the kingdom of God, went boldly unto Pilate, asked him for his body. And when uh, Pilate knew that, uh, you know, in fact, that he indeed was dead, he granted the request. And uh, the result was that he took the body and buried it in his own tomb. And that tomb had uh, a door, a stone that rolled to the door. And uh, whilst that stone is gone, the tomb is still there. And as you enter into that tomb, you do have the consciousness that someone laid here who was indeed the Son of God. May you recognize Jesus as a son of God. Come to him, ask him to forgive you your sins, and you will know the peace of God that passes all understanding. Thank you.